This is Death of the Reader. We are Flex and Herds here for your Murder Mystery World Tour, our second week discussing The Early Cases of Akechi Kogoro by Edogawa Rampo. And that is not just me butchering the name of Edgar Allan Poe, that is in fact the pseudonym by which our author writes a Japanese series of murder mysteries styled off the West, the father of Japanese detective fiction. Last week on the show, we were talking about how great it was to read through stories like this and find where the influences of the things you love come from. And I've got to say, Herds, these couple of stories, they didn't they didn't hook me in the same way as much, but it still had that same satisfaction <laughs> okay. of reading through the influences of so many things I recognize. Yeah, for sure. I mean... Uh- Rampo has gone on the record to say that these are not these are not his favorite stories, mm. um, but they're very much part of the development of the character um, and the, and and kind of the the history of you know Rampo's involvement in murder mystery and how he uh, how influential he's been on the genre over in Japan. Yeah, I will I will say the Black Hand Gang very much felt like a case of simultaneous discovery uh, alongside. Cheng Shao Kings on the Huang Pu. Yeah. They had mm-hmm. a very, very similar setup. They got a gang, they got a girl missing. I, I wouldn't be surprised if they have a similar payoff too. Yeah. I mean, look, we'll we'll get to that. Uh there is no uh South China swallow in this one. Um the Moriarty character, I it's like the the man with the 20 devil faces, uh, mm-hmm. isn't gonna be appearing in this uh in this look. But maybe maybe we'll come back another time and, and have a have a dig through that. Yeah, I mean, this is just beginning our dive into Eastern fiction, so I'm sure we'll have many opportunities to return to Cheng Shao King and Edogara Rampo. I'm looking forward to it. Uh, but yeah, I mean, the, the Black Hand Gang has a pretty straightforward setup. This girl has gone missing from, 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 from her home, and everyone says, where's she gone? Oh, no, the Black Hand Gang's got her. And then her father goes off to, to hand off some money in exchange for her return, but uh, she hasn't come home. So what's what's happening? It's up to you, Flex, to solve the mystery. But I, I kind of want to touch on the ghost real quick because it's sure. it's a very short story. A protagonist who is not a Kishikoguro and is not our mysterious narrator. Um, it is this middle aged man who has been hunted. Uh, he has been hunted all his life by his his arch nemesis. Um, the, the novel tells us that he's like put glass like shards on his window sills so that no one can climb over them. And he's stationed police officers like on his property to keep this man out. And he, he gets a letter telling him your arch nemesis has passed away. Um, but he basically curses. He curses out our, our, our protagonist since, mm. you know, I'm going to get you even in death. Um, and we go through this whole rigmarole of, of our, our protagonist trying to get away from the ghost to eat, which he keeps seeing pop up. And I'm, I'm kind of curious because as I say, Rampo, he wasn't the biggest fan of the ghost. He considered a failure of a story. How did you, how did you find this one flex? Did I, you enjoy it? I sympathize with Rampo. Mm. Not because I think it is a failure of a story, but I could see if I had written it, that I wouldn't be keen on it. And I think if you are coming in trying to dismantle the initial beliefs of the public that Western mystery cannot work in the East, and you write something as silly as this, <laughs> that that would be a little frustrating yeah. because, you know, sometimes a story takes a different form to what you initially envision. And I think that the way that this basically comes in and says, oh, I was just working at the post office yes. all along. It was the setup to Men in Black 3. Yeah. What? Um, I haven't seen that. Spoilers. <laughs> It, it starts off and says it made quite an ominous tale, mm. but in the end, it's just like he picked up a picture frame and he's like, oh God, a dead guy, and <laughs> threw the picture frame away. Then he picks up the picture frame again and goes, oh God, the dead guy is still in the picture, throws it away yeah. again, picks it up again. Oh no, he's still there. Like, it doesn't have a horror element. It's just kind of dumb. Yeah, it's, <laughs> it's not... Well, that's that's kind of the interesting thing that clearly Rampo is trying to play off of ghosts horror tropes while still making them real like this yeah, this yeah. could happen to you but in the process all of his sort of scary moments are so downplayed in the narrative i i will say though there there is one moment that i kind of like um it's more an implication than explicit story beat but he finally gets so stressed out about this ghost following him that he like departs to his his favorite inn mm-hmm. 
Um, and he goes for like a walk on the beach and it's getting dark. He's like, oh, I hope nobody accosts me in this darkness. And he sees the ghost um, of his nemesis, who's actually a real person who is alive. Um, but just as he's going to to walk over and like figure out what's going on with this ghost, that's when Akeshi shows up and says, oh, what are you doing out here by yourself, good sir? Why don't you come along here to the inn? I'll get you sorted out. Mm-hmm. And Again, it's not explicitly stated, but if Akeshi hadn't come along at that moment, Hirata would have walked right into the ghost and gotten stabbed. Mm-hmm. Like, <laughs> he came this close to death. And it's such an understated moment. I'm not sure if it's intentional or not. Like, it, like it, it's a moment that could have been truly horrifying, you know? Seeing the ghost, seeing its, like, fangs and, like... It's holding something in its hands. Is it's yeah, its own yeah. severed head? Like, what's going on there? Like, it could have been such a horrifying moment. It has the potential, but it, it just isn't. Uh, it, it's very kind of dryly delivered. Well, yeah, and that's kind of the weird thing because that's also the best part of it. Mm. Is it plays down all of these elements of it, so it's just a really quick read about this <laughs> yeah. old guy getting freaked out, and then it being, oh, don't worry, it's just the guy running the post office. Like, that's funny. That's yeah. it's it just is, silly. It's more of a comedy. And and I love it. It was because it's, you know, it's a really short story. So it's a really quick read and you can have a great time with it because it's excellence is its mistaken simplicity. Yeah, it's a it's a mistake. Yeah, there's so many things in here that clearly aren't what they read as, but it still just works. And yeah, it's great. It's, it's great fun. It's sort of like, that's the thing. It's so short. It's you could just read it in like half an hour 20 minutes to split through it but i i do think that it is it's worth reading on a on a for context reasons for giving you context for his other stories because uh rampo is very much known now for being a writer of the grotesque and, and the the horror the, the the weird the strange yeah um and this is one of his just his early attempts at at writing something that is disturbing and it fails horribly but but knowing that he's going to go on to write stories like The Human Chair um, and, and others, it's interesting. It's kind of uplifting to know that somebody who was so terrible at writing a ghost story eventually went on to write something so visceral and so compelling. Yeah. It's a very clear point of progression, which is one of the best things to see in authors. and I mean, just any creative, mm. because it's so inspiring seeing where people come from. So before we wrap up uh, this this part, what what's your theory on the, the Black Hand gang? What do you think is going on in that story? We've got this missing girl. We've got no footsteps at the scene of the of the handoff. Mm hmm. Of any of any black hand gang members, what's what's going on there? Do you want to throw me a theory? All right. So so the brief that I've been given is that I have to solve the who and the how. The how is the most important part. Here. Now the, the thing is, is I'm not sure what trap you've laid to, for me here, <laughs> because clearly, without a shadow of a doubt in my mind, okay. the only character that the criminal could be is Makita. Okay. Because there is no other character. Okay. That's fair. That's fair. Um, it's, it's very clear to me that when you go to a crime scene with two people and one of them is your perspective and the other is Makita and there are only two sets of footprints. Yeah. Obviously it's going to be Makita. Like that's the clues that we've been given. There's no room to maneuver there. Sure. The other trap that I think you may have laid me Mm -hmm. is that supposedly Akechi says there is someone who is in love with Fumiko, the daughter who is being ransomed. Maybe, yeah. And that he's a Catholic and that he wants the uncle to forgive this Catholic man. Do you think that Makita is Catholic? Initially, initially I thought that it was probably that Makita is keeping uh, his Catholicism secret because supposedly the uncle says he hates Catholicism. Mm. Uh, But I think it would be more reasonable to say that perhaps... Uh, the Catholic is another character and that the ransom was another deal for Makita to do something of his own. Maybe it's his own love story. Uh, Maybe it's financial troubles because being a servant isn't really working out well for him. I'm not too sure. Okay. Uh, So I don't know which of those two traps that you've laid for me, Herds, but I've laid out my solutions to both just in case. Okay, that's fair enough. Um, And I think that's all I have to say on that. How how is Makita kind of making that happen? What's what's the how here, Felix? 
Well, because he's he's uh, in charge of the post and all of the oh, photography is, is coming through the post. I think we'll uh, talk about the solution to this murder mystery or kidnapping mystery on the next part. Is that what you're locking in? I mean, listen, Herds, I feel like you've led me down the garden path. And whilst I could very easily answer those questions, I may not have tried to without you walking me towards them. That's right. So we'll see how that turns out for me. Right, we'll see. Uh, but <laughs> we are discussing the early cases of Akechi Kogoro, The Black Hand Gang, and The Ghost by Edogawa Rampo. This is Death of the Reader. We are Flex and Herds, and we'll be back with more of that in just a second. You're listening to Death of the Reader on 2SCR. This is Herds, and I am joined today by a cultural analyst and writer for digitallydownload.net, uh, Mr. Matthew Sainsbury. Matthew, welcome to the show. Hello, and thank you for having me on. Matt's fine, by the way. <laughs> Matt's fine? Yeah, Matt's fine. Alrighty, I'll switch to Matt going <laughs> forward. All good. Well, let's let's dive in, shall we? So, so Matt, uh, Edgar Ranpo's work is, is obviously it's inspired by... Arthur Conan Doyle's Sherlock Holmes, right? But he goes mm. out of his way to highlight the distinction of, of Japanese culture. Uh, in The Murder on D Hill, which we actually covered last week on the show, the, the nature of the mystery relies on uh, the, the fact that Japanese houses are so easy to look into. And, and Rampro plays on this idea to create uh, an interesting and uniquely Japanese piece of detective fiction. Um, Matt, you're, you're quite well read on the subject. Is there a, a singular quality of Rampo's writing or perhaps Akeshi Kogoro's character that, that has let these works stand the test of time? Yeah, that's a good question. Um, the great thing about Rampo was, that, like you say, it is a, he basically, what he did was he took his love of detective fiction from the West and his, his yeah. pen name is derived from Edgar Allan Poe. He was obviously hugely inspired by um, Arthur Conan Doyle and Sherlock Holmes, but he does wrap in a lot of the, the Japanese uh, aesthetic and, I guess, way of looking at, uh, at life and narrative into his work. So a lot of his stories have a kind of a supernatural element to them in, in a way that I think the Western crime fiction authors that he was most closely inspired by didn't really do. I mean, even, you know, Edgar Allan Poe was a, a great Gothic writer, but he still had a, there, there was still a, a greater sense of realism to his work. So the reason that I found Rampo so interesting over time is that he does divorce himself a little bit more from reality. Yeah, for sure. Actually, today we, we covered uh, the story of the ghost uh, by Mr. Rampo, which is not, it's uh, s- self-proclaimed. It, it's one of his least favorite of his works. Um, mm-hmm. And it is uh, p- probably the most supernatural of the stories in, in the early cases of Ikeshi Kogoro. Um, but it, it doubles back the ghost. It turns out at the end that the ghost isn't really a ghost. It was all a trick. Why do you think that we remember him so much more more prominently for his uh, for his detective fiction influence rather than his supernatural, his, his horror tendencies? I, I think that's because the at least as far as we are concerned here in the West, our understanding of Asian horror has changed over over time. You just think about what you imagine a Japanese or a Korean or a Chinese horror thing to be, whether it's a film or book or whatever, and the vision that you have is something very different to what Rampo really wrote about. Uh, and as, as a result, I think we don't really necessarily make that connection, but certainly uh, a lot of Rampo's work, especially the, the later stuff and when he started to implement you know those those kind of stronger supernatural elements there's a, there's a certainly also a, a, i guess a a sense of kind of a horror behind the fiend with 20 faces which is another reoccurring character with rampo those things when you look at them in the context of japanese literary tradition they have a they do have that horror element or at least that kind of that supernatural ghost el- or s- spiritual element to them which we don't see in the West these days, simply because that is um, that that's not our understanding of Asian horror. Yeah, uh, you mentioned the the fiend with twenty faces, who unfortunately isn't part of the early cases. That was a, a character who was kind of mm. developed later down, later down the line. Um, I would compare the fiend with twenty faces, at least by reputation, uh, with the character of Moriarty from from the Sherlock Holmes stories. Do you think that this is a, a justified comparison? And, and do you think that? Uh, that Rampo deserves the title of the Japanese Arthur Conan Doyle. Is he quite that quite that high standing? Is that is that accurate? I would say in Japan certainly he has the he he was as influential on later text as um, as Conan Doyle has been in the West uh, because I mean you look at some of the stuff that um, 
directly comes from Edgar Ramper, like K- K- Detective Conan, which is a massively popular character out of Japan. In fact, the, the recent Detective Conan film outdid Star Wars in the Japanese box office. Oh, um, really? Yeah, when it released. So that's how influential that anime is. And that is directly inspired by Edgar Rampo. Uh, a lot of really popular video games are, which we don't necessarily make the connection again in the West because perhaps Edgar Rampo is not as well known out here, but um, Persona 5 is a very popular video game. It is directly oh, inspired. Really? I, I hadn't heard of that one. Definitely not familiar with that one. <laughs> it is <laughs> it, it is directly inspired by uh, Rampo. So I, I certainly think that you know, Rampo himself has, is as influential in the Japanese kind of uh, entertainment industry as Conan Doyle has been in the West. As to whether The Fiend with 20 Faces as the kind of the antagonist of Akechi is comparable to Moriarty, I find The Fiend with 20 Faces to perhaps be a little bit more associated with uh, Lupin. Interesting. It's perhaps just my own spin on it, but I think also because uh, Lupin has become so closely related to Akechi in Japan, because Lupin is a massively popular character in Japan, and for some reason they like to do this crossover where you know, Akechi ends up uh, opposing Lupin in some way. So I, I see Fiend with 20 Faces have been in that kind of mould, but I think that's possibly because uh, that's just how things have panned out with the, with the way you know, subsequent authors have handled uh, Rampo's characters. Now you mentioned Persona, and I I know that this is uh, you know this isn't a an anime and video games uh, you know podcast you're listening right now on Death of the Reader. We are murder mystery focused, but uh, <laughs> I actually discovered uh, the Persona link last week live on the air as we were discussing the murder on D Hill. Uh, uh, apparently, uh, there's this character called Goro Wikechi, who is you know a totally separate character to uh, Akechi Kogoro. Uh, but apparently he's he's a big character in the Persona series. W- would you like to elaborate on that? I hear you have some experience, some fascination with this character. Yeah, so sorry to bring video games into your, your podcast. We have to, we have to now. I'm in much. control. Look, <laughs> Lex isn't here, so this is all we're going to do today. <laughs> um, but, yeah, I mean, Akechi is explicitly based on Akechi from mm. Edogawa Rampo. He fulfills the same role within the plot, uh, he ends up being kind of the the antagonist because the player character is in the role of Lupin to bring back to what I was saying earlier. So actually, sure. just to to be very brief with explaining this to people who maybe aren't so familiar with Persona Five, in Persona Five, your character goes and collects a whole bunch of different personas, a bit like Pokemon, which is probably the more common reference. But um, those personas are named after various mythological figures or literary figures or whatever. Sure. The, f- the first persona that you pick up as in the main one, it becomes kind of your character's uh, identity, is called Lupin. So um, of course it is. The, the link is quite there. You, you're you in the role of Lupin. You play as a phantom thief, so you're breaking into various kind of fantasy buildings to steal treasures and stuff, and it's all metaphorical. But it is that is the role that you play, and then the antagonist is... For, for much of the game is Akechi, and he is in the role of Akechi from Itagawa Rampo. So that's how kind of explicit that link is in that particular game. And it just goes to show just how influential Rampo has been in Japanese crime fiction that this guy who was, you know, what, this died 50 years ago or more now, um, is, is still influencing, you know, the main plot lines for the biggest games and kind of cultural products coming out of Japan. Yeah. Well, there's an interesting kind of cycle in uh, different media properties will sort of learn, uh, learn, learn tropes from each other and take elements. And we see this sort of cycle of characters. So uh, one, one of the lines that I, uh, I uncovered last week on the show again uh, was that if you, if you Google search Akeshi Kogoro persona and the very first thing that came up on my, uh, on my, my search engine was that uh, some, somebody asking about, if maybe Akeshi, uh, or sorry, Goro Akeshi was inspired by Light from Death Note, uh, you, you can almost draw this line from uh, from Rampo's work to Death Note and then to Persona. And that's something that we like to do on Death of the Reader. We like to show the through line from one novel to the next. I, I guess my question is, uh, is there... Is there any story in the West that you think might have been influenced by these by these sources, this very particular type of detective fiction? Yeah, that's a difficult one. I would say that Edogawa Rampo himself has not inspired too many Western authors. And the reason I say that is simply because 
Edgar Rampo was so heavily inspired by Sir Arthur Conan Doyle yeah. that every Western author that might be in that mould is going to be inspired by Conan Doyle first and foremost anyway because Sherlock Holmes is kind of ubiquitous to our, our culture, right? So as much as, I, I mean, I think you're, yeah, this kind of segment is great because it's actually highlighting an author that I do think deserves a lot more recognition in the West because sure. as much as we constantly talk about him being inspired by Conan Doyle, he did do some things to the Japanese literary uh, world, which has been massively influential over the past century and continues to be so. And I think if you're yeah. going to get into, I guess, for want of a better term, foreign literature, and you want to learn a little bit about the, the Japanese literature tradition, the, the crime fiction industry in Japanese writing is so large, so significant, so prominent over there. Uh, a lot of that traces back to Rumpo. Thanks for chatting with me, Matt. It, it's been an absolute blast to have you on the show. Thank you very much for your time. Always happy to talk about Edegawa, Edegawa Rampo. <laughs> <laughs> of course, of big, course. Big fan. Yeah, well, I, that's what I heard. That's why I got you on. <laughs> <laughs> All right, let's get right back to the solution of the Black Hand Gang and see if Flex has managed to solve it. You're listening to Death of the Reader. You are listening to Death of the Reader. We are Flex and Herds with your Murder Mystery World Tour, continuing our discussion of the early cases of Akechi Kogoro by Edogara Rampo. As I continue to butcher each and every attempt at pronouncing those names, we are talking the Black Hand Gang and the Ghost today. I have just been tasked with solving the second half of the Black Hand Gang. Mm-hmm, mm-hmm. And I don't know, Herds, I feel like I nailed it. Uh, mostly. You got like 95%. The only thing I think I explicitly got wrong mm. is that I would have suggested that uh, Makita and Fumiko were in cahoots on this plan rather than Makita taking advantage of the situation. But I don't think that is within the scope of what I was asked to do. So are you going to pay up, Herds? Sure, you can have your point. That's fine. You have have your plus one point. Ding. Uh, Yeah, but boy, is the solution to this mystery both very simple and very complicated. Yeah. Um, Because really all it turns out is that there were two lovers who wanted to be with two other lovers, and it's great, and it's super cute, and everyone gets to be with their loved ones at the end, Mm -hmm. and it was the post-solution again, which is very silly. I don't know why Rampo decided to have two mystery stories that he wrote pretty much back to back, both of which use the post solution. Like I don't, <laughs> does he have no other ideas? <laughs> I, um, I almost <laughs> feel like what happened is that he wrote the ghost first. Yeah. Went, ah, oh, damn it. I've wasted this solution on a bad story. Yeah. Used it in the black hand gang. And then someone convinced him to publish the ghost anyway. Uh, yeah, I, I wouldn't go into that much detail, but I think it's it's something akin to that. Maybe he did write the Black Hand Gang first. I was like, eh, like I kind of like this solution. Maybe I should just like use it on use it for a, for a story that I don't really care about. Yeah, whatever's going on there, uh, it's ended up with him using the exact same solution. Mm-hmm. Although, uh, shout out in, in a in a brilliant throwback to the two cent copper coin story. Uh, Rampo has again provided us with not one but two tables of ciphers and and numbers and and kanji that we that we don't understand. It's great. Now listen. Yeah. Listen. Yeah. Mr. Rampo, uh, <laughs> Rampy, if I could if I could call you as such. Rampy. Okay. When last week I asked you to break one of the rules of detective fiction. Oh no. I did not want it to be <laughs> the fourth Knox rule. Uh huh. I suffered enough through Joseph Skvreski's <laughs> sins for Father Knox mm-hmm. on account of him trying to break that rule, and you didn't do any better. Yeah. Multiple tables of ciphers and cryptography, and let me, can I can I quote the book? Can I quote the book, Herds? Sure, go for do it. Do I have your permission? Yes, only if you do it in an appropriate voice for Ranpo, the aged oh, okay, excellent. Japanese uh, author critic. <clears throat> Looking at these numbers, we That's see it. that the left radicals go up to 11, and the remainders only go to 4. Don't those numbers remind you of something? For example, they couldn't express an arranged sequence such as the 50 sounds of the conosyllabary. As a matter of fact, when we line up the consonants of the conosyllabary, they number precisely 11. What? 
It's obvious. I don't understand how you couldn't have gotten this flex. Really, I should deduct a point just for not knowing these very basic facts about Kana syllabary. Syllab- syllabary. <laughs> On the plus side, though, you don't really need to solve this cipher in order to figure out the mystery. Um, the the suggestion that the uh, the original postcard is has been delivered by a lover mm. um, kind of gives you enough clues to figure out what's going on. Um, and especially with the hindsight of the ghost story, the postcard sort of uh, solution is pretty obvious. Yeah. As I said at the end of the first section of the show today, I think I could have answered all the questions you wanted of me, but I don't know if I would have right. if you hadn't led me down the garden path. Look, that's sometimes sometimes that's my job on the show, to make sure you actually say the things that I want you to say. Okay, it's it's the psychology, of course. Of course, of, of course. course. What of a course. what a stunning integration, Herds. Thank you. I thought about that for at least three seconds. <laughs> um, but you know, I think that ultimately the solution to this story is really neatly worked around that cipher. It's kind of yeah. fun that the cipher is there for the kind of reader that has opened up the newspaper that this was contained in and gone, ah, a mm. puzzle for me to solve. Yeah. And solve the puzzle and had a great time and everyone else can just breeze on past it and enjoy the simple brilliance of the rest of this mystery. Yeah, and of course we find out that it was the brilliantly foreshadowed character named Hattori Tokyo who had kidnapped Fumiko. Well, kidnapped more, they ran away together. No, this character is never mentioned in the story before the solution, which is a little bit weird, but... Yeah. Pff, what, what are you going to do about it? Rampo is a, a, a subversive writer and loves to just throw rules out the window. So why would we even mention characters in the first half of the story? That's in, just silly. In fairness to Rampo, I mm. did, through the implication of a additional Catholic character, infer their existence, uh, but that does nonetheless somewhat break the first Ronald Knox rule sure. that the criminal must be someone mentioned in the early part of the story. But who's the who's the criminal here? Isn't it Marketer well, for stealing the money? I mean, by by the observation of the father, who is the one identifying the crime? But what has he done? What is his crime? For stealing the young maiden's heart away? Is that yes, is because that a he true does crime? not like Catholics. You are heartless. You are a heartless man. I, I'm not heartless. I'm injecting heartless. myself into the perspective of heartless. the authority in this story. But is the detective not the greatest authority in a murder mystery? I hope not. I hope not. <laughs> Listen, if an amateur detective is the highest point of authority Uh you have in your crime novel, I'm concerned that you may be living in an anarchist hellscape. (laughs) (laughs) You know what? That's fair. That's fair. Uh, But it is, uh, this is something worth noting, actually, that it it is the detective, Akeshi Kogoro, who is is given the authority in these stories to actually dole out the... Uh, the, the moral consequences. Um, he, he, although, before anybody jumps on this, he most of the time decides not to, uh, which is fun. It's really weird. I think that there have been very few mm. stories that I have read where the detective has taken that stance, where the detective has said, I will allow you to do what you will regarding your innocence of, on this case. Sure. It's important to note that the idea of the police carting off the criminal at the end of the story yeah. isn't a must in this genre. It isn't the be-all and end-all of how a, cr- a, a crime fiction novel, and particularly detective fiction novel, has to conclude. Yeah. Um, some of the stories we've covered this year, though I won't spoil any of them explicitly, <laughs> have tackled with that in one way or another, but I feel have largely still lent on the trope of the criminal being carted off at the end. And it's interesting to see that it has taken us going to 1920s China and Japan to see anything really different. Yeah, I mean, it's it's a topic that we uh, we was we were exposed to with Sherlock and Shanghai, but the novels and the places in culture where two two sides of the coin collide, where we collide Western and Eastern uh, ideologies and and perspectives on crime and punishment, I think are going to be very interesting to unpack and explore and i'm really i'm really looking forward to that well herds there is only one thing left in this book to yes. cover <laughs> the dwarf and- <laughs> uh yeah we're going to be covering uh the dwarf it's, it's its name not a very compelling title but it was his first big, big hit like it was made into two movies so people enjoyed it clearly uh we, you'll be reading up until uh, the final chapter shifting the blame uh, and we will see if you can solve 
uh, the, the true nature of this crime. Thank you for joining us here on Death of the Reader this week. We'll be back next week with more of the early cases of Akechi Kogoro by Edogawa Rampo. You're listening to 2SER.